Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to SNAM's 2017 first half results presentation. Let me start with an overview of the highlights of this semester. I will then hand over to Alessandra for more color on our consolidated results. The external environment continues to be supportive for gas. In the first six months of the year, demand in Italy was up by almost 10%. This is a 10th consecutive quarter of increase. Half of the overall improvement of 2.1 BCM was driven by power generation, where gas demand was supported by reduced imports from France owing to the nuclear shutdown. This highlights once again the importance of gas for the security of the system. In addition, power generation from hydro and wind was lower during the first six months of the year. Gas consumption in the industrial sector was mainly driven by the steel, mechanical, paper, glass, and ceramic segments, in line with the continuing recovery of the Italian industrial production. Residential demand was flat on a weather-adjusted basis. Demand in Europe also continued to increase. In the first five months of the year, it was up 2.3% in six major countries, representing about 70% of total consumption. This is mainly thanks to the contribution of the power sector, but also due to an increase in industrial and residential. On the policy front, the Italian government started the consultation process for the country's energy strategy, the so-called SEN. This process will last until the end of August of this year. The draft document contains a number of potentially supportive points for SNAM, including measures to increase the cost competitiveness of gas also through incremental LNG regasification capacity, scenarios for an accelerated phase out of coal power generation, third, the methanization of Sardinia, and finally measures to support incremental use of natural gas for transport in Italy. Moving to regulation, a new consultation document was published on the 8th of June. This introduced a transition period of two years for transport and regas, which means that the fifth regulatory period will now start in 2020. Among the items which would characterize the transition period lasting from January 2018 to December 2019 are the proposed cancellation of the time lag between spending and remuneration and the preservation of some incentives on development capex. Overall, we consider this transition period broadly neutral compared to the current regulatory framework. The WAC update, including an update of the formula for the risk-free rate, the country risk premium, the tax rate, and the target leverage will occur in January 19, as previously expected, with the observation lasting from October 17 to September 18, in line with previous indications. The consultation document also confirms that the regulator will look at introducing output-based incentives in the new period in preparation for TOTEX. Now, turning to our activities. All our core businesses are progressing well. In the first half of the year, we reached some important milestones, including 23 new significant construction sites, 25 primary permits, the commissioning of 53 kilometers of new pipes, and the completion of maintenance work in the Corte Maggiore field. With regards to our affiliates, TIGF just obtained final approval from the French authorities to construct the Gascogne Midi pipeline. This will improve the connection between the south and north of France and contribute to eliminating the price differentials between these two areas. Entry into operation is expected by the end of 2018. Our efficiency program is exceeding expectations. 85% of the planned initiatives have now been launched, accompanied by a company-wide lean transformation that has already started to redesign 10 core business processes. Just to give an example, we have completed the review of all the company procedures and are now targeting a streamlining that will lead in the reduction of over 70% of these procedures. Overall, 5.5 million euros of savings have already been delivered in the first half, meaning that we are well on track for full year guidance of exceeding 10 million euros of savings. Alessandra will give you further details on the initiatives launched. 
With regards to new business activities, we now signed three agreements with important strategic partners to develop the CNG business in Italy, including the latest and most significant one with ENI. SNAM Global Solutions is already meeting potential partners where our distinctive competencies may add value. Let's move to our incremental investment in the Italian grid announced earlier. We have added a strategic 83 kilometers of pipeline with a 36 inch diameter and a total transmission capacity of 9.6 billion cubic meters to our grid. This fully regulated asset represents the only entry point into the national transmission system that was outside of SNAM's perimeter. The pipeline was valued um, considering RAB incentives and synergies as a regulated business. And we have also acquired uh, alongside the pipeline a minority stake in the Adriatic LNG, which has been based uh, on fully contracted volumes until 2034. The split in the overall valuation that was 225 is about two, uh, three quarters for the pipeline and one quarter uh, for the minority stake in the regasification terminal. Turning now to first half figures, CAPEX was 425 million. This includes 378 in the transport business, of which 46% is related to the development of the network and is eligible to be incentivized. Revenues were 2% higher than last year as past investments entered into the ramp. EBIT was up 3.6%, benefiting from the significant um, results on the cost efficiency plan. Net income was up 18% year on year to 504 million, helped by the very meaningful reduction in the cost of debt and the increase in income from associates. Finally, end of June net debt was 11 billion 176 million, including a positive effect from working capital that may be absorbed by year end. This does not include the 225 million acquisition we just announced. I will now hand over to Alessandra for a closer look at our results. Thank you, Marco. EBIT in first half 17 was 714 million, up 25 million or 3.6% over the same period of the previous year. This reflects approximately 11 million euro increase of regulated revenues due to the RAB increase, an increase in transport revenues as a result of the higher transported gas of about 8 million euro, which we expect to retain for the rest of the year. The first half result of our, the first result of our efficiency plan launched in March for about 5.5 million euro that broadly offset the disynergies coming from the demerger and the natural evolution of labor costs. Higher amortization in line with our asset profile evolution, strong reduction of the cost mainly driven by one-off demerger costs and capital losses sustained in 2016. Let me now spend some more time on our efficiency plan. In the first half, we have launched more than 85% of the saving initiatives identified in March. These initiatives include the renewal of some contracts for the operation and maintenance of the ICT infrastructure, as well as the optimization of the ICT infrastructure itself and some ICT application maintenance services. We continue to focus on new technologies through the Smart Gas project and final customer meters reading. Review some operational standards to pursue efficiencies while maintaining unchanged or increasing the level of service. We are now installing new video serverless systems in order to reduce security monitoring costs and starting the replacement of traditional lighting with LED technology, both on storage sites and network facilities. We also obtained savings on external costs relating to corporate services, critically reviewing the consultancy costs and optimizing some contracts with reference to corporate services. The good progresses on these initiatives, along the line with the identification of new ones, allow us to be confident to be well on track for our four-year guidance of 10 million euros for the year. Turning to the net profit, the first half of 2017 recorded 504 million euros, up 77 million, or 18% versus last year. 
The increase was driven by the just commented, commented positive performance of our operations, lower net interest expenses of 32 million euro, of which 10, 21 million thanks to the reduction of the cost of debt, driven by the liability management executed last year and new issuances executed this year, and 11 million thanks to the <coughs> lower average debt following the demerger of Italy gas. Higher contribution from associates thanks to the inclusion of GCA acquired in December 2016, the good performance of the surge business in TIGF, and improved performance of tax. Lower taxes due to the reduction of corporate income tax rate, notwithstanding an higher earning before tax. The tax rate for the period was around 26.6%, consistent with our full year guidance. Let me now give you the usual update on SNAM debt structure. Uh, as regards to capital markets, in the first half, NAM issued an aggregate, an aggregate amount of 1.2 billion in order to uh, substantially cover 2017 and 2018 maturities and proactively manage possible rate increase. With the issuance of the five-year 400 million euro convertible bond, NAM has issued two zero-coupon bonds in the last nine months. Furthermore, this morning, NAM signed a new EIB financing for 310 million at a very competitive 1.5% fixed cost. Overall, SNAM now holds 1.5 billion of institutional lender financing with an average maturity of nine years. Our average cost of debt in the first half was already 2.2% versus 2.6% in the first half of 2016 and 2.4% for the entire 2016. This was due thanks to the liability management exercise executed last year and the funding, funding actions completed uh, in the first half of 2017. We confirm our guideline of 2.2% for the full year, which still offers some room for optimization. As regards the breakdown, the fixed rate portion is now 77% in line with our guidance provided earlier in the year. The maturity profile is well spread avoiding major concentration issues, and our liquidity profile remains strong with 3.2 billion of undrawn committed credit lines. In mid-July, we executed 750 million of forward starting swaps in order to pre-edge interest rate rise risk of part of our bond issuance in 2019 and 2020. Lastly, uh, together with Allianz, we have signed the refinancing of GCA acquisition package mostly with a 12-year product placement replace, replacing the existing banking facilities. Cash flow from operations for the period amounted to 1.4 billion euro. Working capital changes include 306 million euro due to the seasonality effect and to the time lag between the cashing of tariff-related items not yet paid to the equalization fund, which we expect to normalize by year-end. 64 million euro of positive working capital owing, owing to net tax payment, and 94 million euro related to overcharging and penalties for exceeding committed capacity. The reported cash flow from operations fully financed net investment of 608 billion euro, including the further financial investment related to our participation in TAP of about 106 million euro. Following the share buyback activity of 202 million euro and the payment of the dividend, the increase in net debt for the period was 120 million euro. Considering the working capital improvement achieved in the first half, our guidance for the full year debt is now 11.4 billion or 11.6, including the just announced uh, investment in the Edison assets. We remind you that this assumes the expected true up on top financing. Thank you for your attention. We'll now be pleased to take any question you may have. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question at this time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you find that your question has already been answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing star 2. We will now take our first question from Enrico Bartoli from Main First. Please go ahead, sir. Your line is open. 
Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Uh, first of all, I have a question regarding the associates' contribution in uh, in the first half. Uh, um, I understand that probably the the real breakdown cannot be given, but just uh, uh, some comments for you on, uh, let's say, the evolution of the contribution, particularly from uh, TIGF, from TAG, and uh, the the consolidation of uh, GCA. And uh, if you can give us uh, a guidance for the full year, considering uh, the extremely strong uh, uh, contribution from this line in, uh, in the first half. Then I have uh, a question regarding uh, uh, Greece. Uh, the, um, the newspaper uh, reported that you are interested in, uh, in the privatization of uh, DESPA. If you can provide us some comments, particularly the, let's say, the possible strategic fit of uh, the company in Greece uh, with, uh, with the current profile uh, of uh, uh, OSDAM and uh, uh, the level of competition that you expect uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this tender. And uh, regarding uh, uh, Greece, uh, possibly some details on the MOU on uh, the test that you have uh, uh, signed in the past days and uh, what, what can be the, the possible expected contribution to your numbers uh, uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Enrico, for your questions. Let's start with Greece. Uh, of course, uh, our policy, you know, is not to comment on, on specific M&A um, rumors. Uh, let's uh, uh, go through our investment criteria uh, that are first and, and foremost our commitment to the current uh, credit uh, metrics and risk profile. The second uh, part is that the investment needs to generate, of course, accretive returns. The third part is that we look at investments which somehow enhance the value of our existing infrastructure and finally allow us to leverage our industrial capabilities and unlock additional growth. So these are, are the metrics we use when looking at investments. Uh, in relation to Greece, if I apply these metrics, uh, depending on what the regulation will be and the returns uh, would be, which we don't know yet, the other uh, items uh, could, could be well applied to Greece. Uh, so I would limit uh, myself to that comment as I have done in the past. Uh, the process is underway. Uh, there's a deadline on the 7th of August for expressions of interest, and I expect some competition for this asset given the strategic positioning of Greece uh, in, the, in the map of European infrastructure. Regarding the MOU, um, I would just highlight that you will see uh, hopefully more and more MOUs uh, as uh, SNAM Global Solutions starts its commercial efforts to interact with customers and propose services. Some of these MOUs may lead to uh, small contributions which are meaningful because they allow us to deploy uh, our capabilities. They are uh, attractive margins because they don't require any uh, capital employed, but I wouldn't look at any of these uh, in particular in isolation and expect a, a contribution uh, to come from the single one. So this is just a heads up to expect going forward a number of these MOUs to be announced that aren't uh, the, the typical kind of announcement that we would make at, at SNAM, which you're more used to kind of investment uh, opportunities and investment agreements. So I think it's it's normal as we become more commercial to have some of these MOUs come out. In terms of the associates, I, I don't think we will give a specific breakdown. I think the, the overall expectation uh, should be uh, around 140, 145 uh, for the year based on, on where we stand today. Thank you. Thanks. We will now take our next question from Marie Diaz from UBS. Please go ahead, your line is open. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, well, based on, on, on this result, it looks like uh, you are well on track to meet your 900 million of net income target for the full year. And, um, and so my question is, if you beat your initial expectations uh, meaningfully, could we perhaps see some upside on your current dividend policy? So this is my first question. My, uh, my second and last question is, uh, based on current market conditions, where could we expect the average cost of debt uh, to stand in 2018? Where, where do you think, or what do you think it could be a, a reasonable level? Thank you. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, 
too early to talk about dividend. I think we talk about dividends when we look at the plan, not when we look at the at the backward looking uh, half year results. Um, Alessandra, do you want to comment on the 2018 uh, expected? On the cost of debt, I think we uh, we are looking at two as a target, but it's an ambitious target. So I'm not saying that this is going to be what we are currently, what we have in our numbers. But we, it's also a function of how much we can further reduce from the 2.2 we had achieved in the first half, frankly. So it's uh, 2.1. Let's say 2.1. Okay. 2.1. Thanks, Rui. Thank you. We will now take our next question from Harry Wilbert from Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking my questions. So uh, a couple for me, please. Uh, firstly, just um, and I apologize if this was covered right at the beginning because I, uh, I had started slightly late. But on the ITG deal, could you give us uh, um, just some, some uh, I don't know, goal posts on uh, potential earnings contribution? So maybe EPS accretion or EBITDA from uh, that asset. Uh, and also, could you tell us where your uh, net debt to RAB will, will sit once that uh, deal has been fully uh, completed, and then uh, from that level, how much extra balance sheet headroom do you have from, from here on in for, for any further acquisitions? Uh, and then uh, the, the second one is just more kind of longer term and strategic. Uh, we've seen across Europe uh, big increases in, in the amount of gas flowing around the, the, the European transition distribution systems. Um, obviously, that doesn't have any has quite a small direct impact on your earnings this year, but strategically, both organically within Italy and uh, in wider Europe, particularly when you're looking at acquisitions or, or organic projects outside of Italy, um, has this increased the number of opportunities? Are there regions where uh, the, the gas infrastructure is less developed and where the, the increases in, in gas volumes that we're seeing because of uh, cheaper uh, gas uh, are leading to, to opportunities to, to basically build more infrastructure? So have you, have you seen more opportunities uh, coming from that? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Harry. So on the Infrastructure Transporto Gas, as you say, the ITG deal, um, the, what I said earlier is that uh, about three quarters of the contribution, the consideration of 225 million should be attributed to the pipeline and a quarter to uh, the minority stake in the regas terminal. The pipeline is expected to generate an EBITDA of around 18 million euros, one eight. Uh, in 2018 when we factor in uh, the synergies that we have with this asset. The minority stake it has been valued based on, uh, let's say, the uh, DCF of, of all the remaining contracts that expire uh, in until it run until 2034. The deal, as I mentioned, is accretive, uh, both compared to our earnings and also compared to uh, one of the metrics that we use is comparing it to the opportunity of buying back our own stock. So both in terms of IRR uh, and in terms of EBITDA multiples, we consider it accretive compared to, to buybacks at, at this stage. Uh, in terms of net debt to RAB, I think Ale earlier gave the guidance for the full year, uh, including, uh, including uh, this, uh, this investment. On the, on the strategic front, on European front, I, I don't think uh, we, we're seeing any shift in the big infrastructure projects that are necessary for Europe and that Europe is, is working on and that we've uh, laid out uh, previously. What I think is interesting to note is after 10 consecutive quarters of growth in Italy, the, the immediate consequence is that in, in today's energy policy, which is not a law, it's not a decree, it's just a directional plan, there are really a number of items that put gas back into center ground of the energy policy. And I think this is very healthy for SNAM. Uh, it can lead to an acceleration of some investments, particularly in Sardinia, around a new uh, regasification capacity that the government is now saying is, is necessary. And I think throughout Europe, certainly storages will be used more. Um, there's going to be significant uh, price swings with LNG becoming seasonal and the push to uh, decarbonize and reduce uh, the amount of power generated by coal, I think, is, is really beginning to, to have its impact. What I, what I see as the most promising and interesting trend for the longer term is really a resurgence of gas, not as a transition fuel, but as the long-term 
steady solution, uh, particularly in transport, where not only for ships and trucks there are no alternatives, but also for cars, what we're doing here in Italy on CNG is, is being observed uh, closely around Europe, particularly when linked to biomethane. And there's a new word that's really gaining traction in Brussels, which is renewable gas, which is a word we, we hardly heard before and is now gaining traction as a way of turning waste into fuel for vehicles, which uh, in its full entirety has zero uh, CO2 footprint and, and uh, the same performance as diesel and, and petrol, and depending on taxes, a lot less uh, cost per, per mile or per kilometer. So I think the, this is one of the more interesting trends. We're working with other TSOs across Europe on these, on these items. And I think really the, the role of gas uh, is supported by the growth and demand that we're seeing, but also by some of the technologies and, and the push really uh, against diesel and against coal that's uh, gaining more ground. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. We will now take our next question from Jose Ruiz from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, good morning. Uh, well, good afternoon, sorry. Uh, three very quick questions. The first one is if you could share with us the wrap of Infrastructure Transporto Gas. Secondly, um, if you feel so confident about the cost changes, would you increase the, the target for 2017, the year 10 million euros? And lastly, <clears throat> considering yesterday's news on, on the sanctions on Nord Stream 2, and the expansion of Nord Stream, and the fact that you in April announced this uh, MOU with uh, Eurostream, uh, Naftogaz, and Uktranskaz, uh, do you think uh, that, um, or do you have the suspicions that uh, Nord Stream will uh, fail and the alternative, which is basically reinforce the Ukraine's gas transmission network, will win? Thank you very much. Okay. I, I think on um, on the Italian uh, investment, I think we gave already all, all the details uh, regarding that specific transaction. On uh, the targets, I think you're right. We we are signaling, and Alessandra went into some detail. Uh, we're very confident in the cost efficiency. Uh, we don't think this is the right time of the year to increase targets, but I think you can assume that we will significantly exceed uh, the 10 million that we've laid out. In terms of sanctions, I think, to, like every other company in Europe, we're monitoring what's going on in the States uh, very closely because it, it has a direct impact on the energy market uh, in Europe. Regarding Ukraine, that uh, memorandum um, it has a, has a value of itself, regarding, regardless of what happens to Nord Stream or Turk Stream or other pipelines. There will be some volumes transiting Ukraine, and I think it's in everyone's interest, in, in Europe's interest, certainly in the Ukrainian interest, and also in Gazprom as a supplier's interest, that the transit across the Ukraine is uh, as reliable and efficient as possible. So this is a perfect example of where, if we progress from the MOU, into something more concrete, SNAM Global Solutions could play uh, an interesting role together with other partners to really streamline and, and kind of put in, into uh, better shape uh, this uh, strategic uh, import uh, transit route for uh, Europe. Thanks, Jose Luis. Thanks, very clear. We will now take our next question from Monica Girardi from Barclays. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hello, good afternoon. I have just one question left. Um, Marco, you were talking about the regulation in Greece. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I missed uh, any comment regarding that, but I was wondering if you can just share uh, with me the, the step that you expect in order to have this regulation finalized and uh, what is your understanding in terms of structure? Thank you. No, I think uh, given the government is, uh, is among the sellers and the regulation has a review period in September, I think it will be part of the discussion. Of course, they will need uh, to firm up the regulation before any binding commitment is taken by any of the interested uh, parties. So all I said is that it's uh, uh, not only we don't want to comment in, in particular on specific situations, but to talk about an interest today is premature given we don't yet know 
exactly what the regulatory conditions will be. Thank you. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you have just uh, any kind of uh, idea of how th how the structure would look like. I think there is an existing regulation which is uh, available and well known to to anyone who wants to take a look at what the situ what the current situation is. There is a, a a key point in September where we expect some changes uh, in regulation, which are going to inevitably be part of any discussion between the government and uh, any of the buyers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take our next question from Javier Suarez from Mediobanca. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, hi. Good afternoon to, to everyone. Uh, two or three questions left. Uh, the first one is uh, coming back to the uh, to the deal that you announced, announced yesterday on infrastructure transport gas. Um, is on the um, on the uh, you mentioned an EBITDA contribution from uh, the pipeline of 18 million euros, one eight. Uh, the question is: Is, uh, is the 7.3 percent stake on uh, the regasification plan going to be consolidated through the equity method? And if so, is there any meaningful contribution that we should expect from uh, the equity consolidation line? And also related to the deal, is uh, is there any debt um, in the asset that you are buying? Uh, I'm trying to see the enterprise value to EBITDA multiple that we are paying for, for the asset. So you could uh, give, give us some details on that. That would be appreciated. Then a second question is related to, to the deal and more strategically, obviously you are taking a, a stake into a regasification plan. This does mean that you have a strategically interest on regasification plans and that is something that you are taking uh, a serious look into or is just something that came with the deal and that you are uh, interest, your main interest was in the pipeline and not on the regasification plan. I was interested on your strategical view on that. And the third question is that if you can update us on, on TAP and the possible delay in the completion uh, for this infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks, Javier. So let's start with uh, TAP. On TAP, um, you know the project is a rather complex project technically involving three countries and over 900 kilometers of pipe. Uh, I think we are progressing very well. There's about 35% on, of the onshore part that has already been laid and progressing well in in Algeria in Albania and um, Greece uh, SNAM is playing a bigger role in the project not only thanks to the contract that was signed earlier um, this year with SNAM Global Solutions and also recently with the appointment of Lucas Kepati who was the managing director of SNAM Retegas and is now the MD of the project Certainly, the opposition in Puglia is uh, strong and remains strong. We are uh, doing what we can to step up the dialogue that I think uh, uh, can be stepped up with uh, not the local institutions, but with really the local people to explain that this is not uh, one of those projects that requires a lot of NIMBY opposition because it's uh, below the ground, there's no emissions, there's no impact, there's no uh, health concern. And so a lot of the reasons for the opposition to the project are misplaced. And I think it's our duty and Luca's duty now as MD of TAP uh, to try to reset uh, that relationship locally and, and really explain that there's nothing uh, to worry about uh, for very few kilometers. We have 40,000 kilometers of pipes and we've never had these types of issues. So we remain confident that the project uh, will be completed in 2020 around TAP. Coming to ITG, maybe I uh, deal with the strategic part and then I let Alessandra deal with the accounting treatment. The investment in the REGAS, I don't think we would have considered had it not been linked with the pipeline. So you're right in assuming that it came as part of the deal. Having said that, uh, we are already exposed to regas. We are exposed to um, uh, Panigalia, which is the smallest regasification terminal we have in Europe. And I think getting an exposure into Rovigo, which is one of the more significant and properly functioning uh, based on a load factor and, and its strategic uh, positioning, I think is an attractive asset for us. We have valued this very strictly in line with our approach, which is never to take any commercial exposure. So uh, so long as it's contracted and we've only valued the MPV of the contracts, I think we're treating this like a semi-regulated uh, bit of infrastructure, even if it's not regulated. So yes, 
we are in the LNG chain. We are probably subscale. We are interested in LNG, but we are not interested to the point of taking any uh, commercial risk uh, in the infrastructure. Ali, do you want to go through the accounting of this? Yeah. This is going to be most likely treated uh, as uh, at cost rather than at equity, being a small minority stake. Okay. Is that clear, Javier? Yeah, it is. Many thanks. Thank you. We will now take our next question from James Brand from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, hi. Uh, just two questions. Firstly, just a clarification on ITG. Are you saying that it doesn't come attached with any debt? I'm, I'm still a bit unclear on that. It's kind of suggested from the, the comment on net debt at the end of the year that it had about a 200 million impact, which would imply it, it's, that's an, the equity investment doesn't come with any debt. But still, be great to um, to get a clarification on that. And the second question is just on the volume growth that you've seen on the gas side this year. I believe that some of that, particularly on the generation side, is due to the slightly exceptional power market conditions with, with pretty weak hydro conditions and, and, and renewable production overall. Um, but there is obviously some, some kind of structural growth coming through. I was wondering whether you could share with us your, your view on the kind of structural growth potential for, for gas demand in Italy over the next second five years or so. Thanks. Thank you, James. So I'll, I'll deal with the volumes. Um, uh, question. I think we highlighted at the beginning that indeed on the generation side we've seen some unexpected reduction in nuclear production in France that has led to fewer imports into Italy and we have seen indeed a reduction in hydro and uh, other renewables. Uh, the growth that we've seen is limited on the industrial sector but I think after many quarters of decline it's healthy for the gas industry and healthy for the broader industrial sector to see uh, a change in, in trend and this is uh, now I think the, the second or third quarter that we see on the industrial segment uh, some increase. I think the more structural increases in Europe will come uh, only with significant uh, phasing out of coal uh, and so that may lead to, to increases in demand. I don't think we are expecting the markets in Italy or in Europe to start growing very rapidly, but I think what's really meaningful is the, the change in direction and the change in trend. Um, Ale, on, on uh, ETG. The, yeah, on, on ETG, I mean, the asset today has a shoulder loan, but from our own standpoint, it will be all funded through our own debt, which is why in the guidance we gave, you have that 200 million delta between 11.4 billion and 11.6. I th I th when, when we say 225, that's really the enterprise uh, value of, uh, of, this, of this investment. Oh, okay, great. Thanks for clarification. Yeah. Thanks, James. We will now take our next question from Olivier Van de Soler from XN. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. So I, I would have uh, uh, three. Uh, firstly, talking again on international M&A, and, and I understand that uh, uh, maybe this would be too specific for you to comment on, but we have seen one of the bigger assets that could potentially be uh, up for sale or, or in which stakes might be up for sale is uh, the LNZ asset of, uh, um, of EDF in Dunkirk. I was wondering if the comments that you've made before on LNG from a strategic point of view would mean that that asset could come uh, yes or no uh, in the kind of assets that you would, uh, that you would consider. Um, the second one was on the, uh, on the guidance for 2017. I think the guidance was 0 0.9 billion. Uh, which I guess can really be anything between 851 and, and 949. I was wondering now that we are uh, halfway through the year, if you could be a bit more specific on, on, on where you think um, we might end up uh, by, um, by year end. And then the last one is actually on, on debt maturity. So you mentioned that you now have around nine years of debt maturity. There seems to have been a um, um, an effort to extend the duration of that, uh, of, of that debt. I, I guess that it's, uh, it's feasible now with the current levels of interest rates. Uh, I wonder if, um, if you consider this the, the, the optimal level of maturity of your debt today or if you would actually seek to, uh, to, to, further, to further extend uh, that, that duration in the, current, uh, in the current context. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the questions. Again, as you, as you indicated, I, I wouldn't comment specifically on, uh, on Dunkirk, but I would always look back at our investment criteria so that you can get a quite a clear picture of whether we would 
be theoretically interested in something always contingent on valuation and, and competitiveness and et cetera. Uh, regarding the uh, outlook and the guidance for net income, I think you're, you're right, 0 0.9 does give a lot of variance. I think we can probably say with confidence we're uh, above 900 to rule out the bottom end of your range. We could probably also say that we're towards the uh, upper half of the scale that you've indicated before. I wouldn't go any further now. Ale, do you want to comment on the third yeah, question? Yeah, on, on, the, on the duration for the nine years you mentioned, that was only a comment related to our institutional lending financing. Mm. Our overall medium long-term uh, maturity is five and a half. Uh, and we think that that number or between five and six is a good maturity as a target because it fits well with the reset we do have and the four, we, we have the flexibility while still coping with uh, good visibility and taking though also benefit uh, from uh, um, relatively lower cost of debt versus going too long. So we, we will keep the focus and the objective of trying to stay within this band, um, trying always to optimize the cost. Okay, that's uh, very clear. Thank you very much. Thanks. We will now take our next question from Stefano Gamberini from Akita Sim. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good afternoon, everybody. I have three questions, if I may. The first regarding the buyback, uh, if I'm not wrong, you still have around 200 million US room uh, to go ahead with acquisitions. So will you go ahead during 2017 or you already reach your uh, um, target uh, for 2017 in terms of buyback? The second regarding uh, uh, the national energy strategy and uh, what you stressed that uh, CNG could grow a lot. Uh, in, in, your cap, in your business plan, you have just 150 million euros uh, investments related to the CNG and clearly nothing regarding from national energy strategy. Could you give us uh, just a flavor of uh, what could be the level of capex that uh, could be added uh, uh, related to uh, these projects in the, in the strategy or if uh, you see more room on CNG? And the last question regarding the consultation paper from the regulator. Um, you said that this is, uh, this is neutral uh, compared to the current situation. Just if you can comment a little bit more uh, regarding the risk that the regulator could introduce uh, also uh, the, uh, not to recognize anymore uh, the work in progress as a uh, rub, but pos to postpone the, the return when uh, um, assets enter on stream. Many thanks. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Stefano. So on the buyback, of the 500, we've indicated that about two-thirds of that uh, it was the, the specific, um, let's say, authorization for internal authorization until the end of 2017. So we have bought back, uh, as of now, around 312 million, and we have to go up to 350 million in 17. Uh, I, I wouldn't take that as a, a, a target because our buyback is necessarily in uh, a function of uh, where the market is and where the stock is. So I think that's kind of a soft indication of what our uh, internal authorization was, was for. So it's not the 500, it's a 350. On CNG, I was referring to CNG more as a positive long-term trend for the gas industry. I don't see us increasing our capex uh, in our plan period, but certainly it's very healthy and positive for our sector if we become not only part of the transition towards a fully decarbonized world, but also a, a big and meaningful part of the solution uh, in a fully decarbonized world. And I think this really uh, has a significant impact on how gas is perceived and therefore the role that gas can play in the energy mix and therefore the infrastructure that supports the development of gas in the energy mix. So it, it's something that's more relevant for the longer term, more relevant for uh, gas advocacy and gas demand in the medium and long term, uh, but is also there with 150, which is not uh, huge for us, but it's still a, a meaningful amount that we're uh, working towards. On regulation, uh, I, I don't think it would be appropriate to be uh, more specific on the leaks, uh, given that uh, the, the, the work in progress, given that the um, uh, consultation is, is still underway. I think you should at this point uh, take uh, our view 
that what we see uh, having um, looked at it carefully is a consultation of, and an approach which is let's say in line with the current regulation and also in line with our assumptions which I would say uh, are on the conservative side our own assumptions that we've indicated in uh, in the full year presentation thanks thank you ladies and gentlemen as a reminder if you would like to ask a question at this time please press star 1 on your telephone keypad we will now take our next question from Anna Maria Scalia from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I notice you're not going to comment on the specific of this transition period regulation, but I was wondering what you thought of regarding TOTEX, because reading the documents from the regulator, they seems to be unlikely to introduce TOTEX in 2020. And I was wondering whether I, there is a chance that you guys try to, you know, accelerate the process. Are you happy if this happens after another four years, or what's your views there? Thank you. I, th I think the the plan is to use this transition period, which is a, a transition that we welcome, of course, because it gives us stability, and I think it also gives us the opportunity to sit down with the regulator. We've already met with them and agreed to set up a, a working group. Uh, as has been done in uh, in other markets, uh, to really uh, take into account these positive evolutions that are taking place in the gas industry, and indeed to work uh, uh, on topics in a consultation mode and in a, at a working group level. I think it would be uh, too soon to to accelerate it to the point that it's effective in 2020. I think it's a it's a deep transition, which is positive for consumers and I think also for us, uh, but requires uh, quite a lot of work as, as we implement that. This requires regulatory work on the framework and also requires internal work that is well underway uh, on changing the control model and just the way we do our job uh, to be uh, not only ready, but to be ahead of the curve in terms of being able to deal with the TOTEX environment. I hope that's uh, helpful, Anna Maria. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question at this time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. There are no further questions over the telephone, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your time this afternoon. Our IR team, as always, is available for any further question. Thank you.